Oh, good morning, everyone. We are continuing our series on the book of Daniel, Trusting God in a Hostile World. The first message we said when life takes a wrong turn, we need to continue to trust and obey God who is in control, that he controls not only kings and kingdoms, he controls our lives, he controls our destiny. The second message we looked at the God of the impossible. When faced with an impossible situation, and Daniel was certainly faced with this task of not only interpreting the dream last week, but even telling the king what the dream was. And uh, the magicians, the wise men said, that's impossible. But God is the God of the impossible. What is impossible with man is, is possible with him. So we said that when faced with an impossible situation, we need to go to God who answers prayers for his glory, who answers prayers for his glory. This morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. We will look at this famous story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've entitled it, Who is Able to Deliver? But before we do that, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we're so grateful to you for your love for us. We thank you that you demonstrated it through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that salvation is not by works, that it is a gift from you through faith, Lord, in the finished work of your Son. I pray, Father, that you would work in our, in our lives, help us, Father, to understand how much you love us, and help us, Father, not only to hear this message, but, Father, to be able to internalize it and make applications in the things that we're going through. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin by looking at another installment of the media short film series. Boy, if you if you look at your Ryan Eagle against Hill. <laughs> Some? Hey, let me, let me get some, bro. Hey, Benji, want to try some? Nah, uh, nah, fam, I'm good. I ain't with that. You're already here, <laughs> might as well. <laughs> Come on, man. Like, it's not, it's not all that bad. Like, it's when you don't even want to try it, bro. Bro, it's so good. Trust me. <laughs> That's a fact, man. Just. Hey. Benji, 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 Benji. Nah, Benji. Chill, 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 nah. Man. I'm vegan. <laughs> I don't want any of your pizza. <laughs> hey guys, peer pressure is real. <laughs> peer pressure is real. Yeah, but it's one thing to refuse pizza. It's another to, to refuse food that's been offered to idols, right, in the, in the first chapter. Um, and, and many times, really, the, the company you keep can influence you either to live for God or to worship idols. In our text, King Nebuchadnezzar was so full of himself that he wanted the whole world to worship him. He forgot the lesson that he learned from last chapter 
where he acknowledged that God is not only greater than any of the gods, that God is greater than any of the kings. And so as a result of what we're going to look at, God's people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, experienced tremendous peer pressure. But peer pressure is not only true back then, it's true today too. Um, high schoolers, you go to a new school, and you're trying to fit in, and you make some friends, and all of a sudden, they, they offer you drugs. And you, if you don't accept it, then you're in danger of losing those friends. What do you do? Maybe you graduated high school, you're now in college, and to your shock, well, in our days, you had different dorm for men and women, but now it's co-ed dorms. And sex is simply a pastime. And so everyone sleeping with everyone else, and there you're always faced with temptations. You're always faced with this pull to give up your standards and to lower your, your stance on what the Bible says. So what do you do? Or maybe you've got graduated from college and you're working. Maybe you're a used car salesman. And because you're honest, you always tell people what's wrong with the car, so they end up not buying it. And so your boss gets mad at you. Don't tell him everything. Just sell the car. You're not meeting your quota. And you have a young family, and you need, you need to, to make these sales. So, so what do you do? Well, peer pressure is real. And in this passage, you find the peer pressure was tremendous. It's one thing to say no to three friends or a few people or your boss. It's another thing when the whole nation is worshiping this idol, and you're the only one that's standing up. In this passage, you find that King Nebuchadnezzar sets up a huge statue. It says in verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plains of Dura in the province of Babylon. And so he sets up this golden statue, 90 feet high, about a nine-story building, nine, equivalent to about a nine-foot story building, and nine feet wide. Um, and, you know, I guess purport, proportionately seems like a rather skinny st statue, but it might include the base, and the base could be anywhere from 30 to 40 feet high. And so it's more proportionate uh, that way, the, the image. But the king wanted to be worshipped. It could be that if, if you recall, the, Im the dream that he had was he was the gold on top and then there were other metals of other kingdoms that would come up. Maybe it's his way of saying, no, Babylon is going to continue forever. So he made it out of, out of gold. Uh, probably not pure gold, probably wood overlaid with gold, but nevertheless, huge figure. And he sets it up in the plain of Dura. We don't know quite where the plain of Dura is. I, I was looking. I was researching it. And there are some that says it's to the south, some that says to the north. We don't know, but we do know it's probably not too far from Babylon because it says it's in the province of Babylon. One excavation shows it about 15 miles south in the tell of Dura uh, that they were able to discover this archaeological find. But we don't know. We just know it's somewhere in the province of Babylon. And the king sends out an order for every official, anyone that's anyone in the kingdom, to come on this day. And they all travel to this plain. And when they get there, there is this statue. And the announcement comes from a speaker who says, he says, hey, listen up, folks. Can I have your attention? As the instruments are going to play, and while it's playing, everyone is to bow down and worship the statue. And those days, because people were polytheistic, they worshiped many gods, this would have been no big deal, except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We don't know where Daniel is at this point. He could have been back in the palace holding the fort down, or he could have been in some kind of mission to go to other countries as a representative of the king. We don't know. But if he had been there, he would have, been, he, he would have sided with these, with these three guys. In fact, it was because of his influence that these three guys were, were so strong in their faith. But the orchestra plays, and you could see a wave of humanity just bowing down. 
know, from the ones who could hear the music to, to the ones at the end, so you could just see this wave of humanity, all of them le- bowing before this huge statue, except for these three people. And they probably would have gotten away with it, but there were those who were looking at them. There were those who were jealous of them. And so even though everyone was supposed to be bowing down and worshiping, there were those who were looking at the side of their eye. Trying to see what these guys would do. And they were so excited that these guys decided to stand up. Because now they have something on them. Because these guys, the the rest of the wise men, were still salty that they were able, that these three were able to uh, be promoted ahead of them. And they were quite young when they were promoted. And they went, they, they went ahead of them in the, in the ranks because of Daniel's influence in interpreting the dream. So these guys were salty and they couldn't wait to spill tea on these guys. They couldn't wait to tell the king so that they could pull these guys down and they could now, one of them could now get the corner office that they've always wanted. So it says in verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. Shows you how, how jealous they were. Verse 9. They tried to make them sound as bad as possible. They declared to the king, O king, live forever. Long live the king. Verse 10. You, O king, made a decree. Is it not that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, Bagpipe and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. The king, you could just see the king nodding, yes. Verse 11, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. The king agrees, yes, that's right. Now notice what they do. They accuse these three. There are certain Jews, and notice they, they emphasize the fact that there are certain foreigners as whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Why did they say that? Because they wanted to emphasize the fact that these guys are so ungrateful to you, king. You promoted them, and behind your back, they disobey you. Behind your back, they undermine your authority. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O oh king, pay no attention to you. King, they, they, these guys, they diss you behind your back. They do not serve your gods. And this king who who worshiped many gods, they don't serve them at all. They don't pay attention to them at all. They don't give heed to them at all. Now, here's the the thing. Neither do they pay attention to your command. It says, or worship the golden image that you have set up. King, these guys made you look bad today. Because, King, if, 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 if everyone would disobey you, if you let these guys get, get away with this, guess what, King? Everyone will start disobeying you. And so they tried to make him look bad. In verse 13, then King Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they, they bought these, brought these three men before the king. The king says, go get them. I want to talk to them. <laughs> and you can see the wise man going, yes. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? At this point, the king was being very nice, being very magnanimous. He he doesn't just say, send them to the the oven. No, he he wanted to get the facts straight. And and probably the king understood that the the other guys were jealous. So let me just get this straight. Let me get the facts straight. Verse 14, he says, "Uh, guys, okay, is it true? And then before they could answer, he says, I'll give you another chance. Maybe you didn't get the memo. Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, Fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. He says, okay, the band is already packing up their instruments, but I'm going to tell them to get it out, and they're going to play a special number just for you three. And if you would obey me, he says, I'll pretend it never happened. 
I'll let you slide. I'll give you a mulligan. But if you do not worship, and here he repeats the threat. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? So here, King Nebuchadnezzar was not only claiming to be a God that is to be worshipped, he's claiming that he's more powerful than any gods, that he is the most powerful, not only most powerful man on earth, but he's more powerful than any gods. This was not an empty threat. I discovered a verse that I've never seen before, or I didn't, you know, just kind of read through it without thinking about it, in Jeremiah 29, 22. Since I was studying for this message again, I, I, looked, I, I found this verse. And it says, Because of them, this curse shall be used by all the exiles from Judah and Babylon. The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon, look what it says, roasted in the fire. This king means business. He doesn't suffer fools. He doesn't suffer insubordination. He has sent people to the oven before. He has roasted people before. Here's my question to you. If you were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how would you respond now? Because you, you see, it's one thing to disobey the king when you don't see the king or the king doesn't see you. It's another thing to be in front of this imposing political dictator, figure, monarch, to be threatened by him personally, and now you have to again make a decision. And at this point, they, they could have made excuses. You know, if it was today, Shadrach could have said, oh, sorry, King, my bad, I, I turned off the notification. I didn't, I didn't get the latest memo. Meshach could have said, hey, king, you know what? We really meant to bow down, but, you know, my back was hurting, and I didn't have a good night's sleep, and so, you know, go ahead and play it again. You know. And Abednego could have thought, you know what? Everyone's doing it. Everyone's bowed down. I mean, just this once, maybe, in front of the king, God will forgive us. Is that what they did? See, the whole point of Daniel... It's not there to be a Daniel. The whole point of Daniel is there to trust in the God of Daniel. The whole point of this story is not that these three guys are special. The whole point of this story is that the God they worship is special. And so it's not like be like these three. It is trust in the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At the end of our story, and let me show you the climax. Let me show you the, the main point that the author is trying to get at. All the way in, in verse 28. And we'll, we'll, I'll show you the end and then we'll, we'll start telling the story towards that end. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants. Now notice what it says. Who trusted in him? That is the main point. That if you want to know what is the big lesson that we are to learn from the book of Daniel, it is to trust God regardless. That's why it says they trusted in him. But what does that trust look like? How do I know if I'm trusting God? There are three characteristics of a person who trusts God. First of all, first of all one who trusts God have great confidence in God. Those who trust God, those who trust the Lord, have great confidence in God. In verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. And so the king asked two questions. The first is, is it true? In other words, you know, did you just miss the memo? Are you going to bow down now? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, King, we don't have to explain ourselves to you. We don't have to justify ourselves to you. In other words, King, our minds are made up. We, we are not going to bow down. And basically, that's what they're saying. We have no need to answer you in this matter. And you could, have, you could hear a gasp from the people who were, who were accusing him. Oh, they did not just say that. 
What do you mean you don't have to answer the king? That's so rude. Yes, you do have to answer the king. <laughs> hey, they just tie an egg on the king. Uh, and, and in their minds, by, by the way, in, in the minds of these three, he says, we're not going to give you any excuses. Well, why? Because in their mind was not excuses. In their mind was Exodus chapter 20. In their mind was the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, it says, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Very clear in the Ten Commandments. You shall not make idols. You shall not make images. But I think it's verse, the next verse that they really had in mind. When they defied the king, which is what? Let's read it together. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. And so they said, we don't need to explain to our, ourselves, king. We, we know where we stand. We are going to be obedient to God's word. I like what Dr. Hendricks uh, used to tell us in class. He says, the opposite of faith is not unbelief. It is disobedience. I love that, that quote. The opposite of faith is not unbelief. It is disobedience. So do, do you trust God? Is your confidence in, in God um, full to, to the point where that you are obedient to him when he tells you something? Daniel 17, if this be so. And here they answer the second question. The second question is, who is able to deliver you from my hands? And they answer it. As if, it, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. The first question, we don't need to answer that, king. The second question, who's, who's able to deliver, you from, from, deliver us from your hands? He says, our God. King, our God is greater than you. They had full confidence that God is greater than the most powerful man on earth. My friends, whenever you're faced with temptation, that's, that's one of the things you need to ask yourself. Is God greater than your boss? Is God greater than your friends? Is God greater than your circumstance? Those who trust God, have great confidence in God. God is greater than any problem I face. Secondly, those who trust God have great courage for God. And it's the second part of, it's this extension to their answer that, that's a real encouragement. Because in verse 18, it's like, our God is greater than you. He is able to deliver. But I love verse 18. One of my favorite verses in Daniel. Let's read it together. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. I love that. Our God is able to deliver us. But if not, we will not bow down to your image. Oh. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because of their faith in God, had great courage for him. They were willing to die for their faith. And it's, it's not a matter of whether God can. It's a matter of whether God will. In other words, it has nothing to do with his ability, O king. It simply has to do with his sovereignty. And I think a lot of times we make the mistake of thinking that just because we have faith, that nothing bad ever happens to us. And that's not the case. You know, I, a, a good way to illustrate this, one of my favorite seasons of the Warriors is We Believe. Remember that? So in the middle of the season, they weren't doing too well. Too well. They were able to get Baron Davis. And they, they went on this amazing hot streak, and they just, they just barely made it. The last game of the season, they made it into, into the playoffs. They were the eighth seed. Do you remember who the first seed was? Dallas. That's right. It was like the David and Goliath. 
And uh, Don Nelson used his inside knowledge of Dirk Nowitzki to, to be able to, to beat them. It was, it was amazing. You know, the oracle had never been that loud. And there was a guy who made up that sign, and the sign is, we, we believe. Now, what is, what, what is the, the non-Christian's view of, of belief or faith? It is that if you believe hard enough, good things will happen, isn't it? That all you have to do is believe, and good things will happen. And sometimes that's how we Christians operate. We think that if I believe hard enough, that I can force God to do what I want him to do. And that's not what faith is. Faith is not imposing our will on God. Faith is trusting God no matter how he responds. Faith is trusting not only in the greatness of God. Faith is trusting in the goodness of God. That whether he says yes or no, I will continue to obey. Whether he says yes or no, I will continue to believe. That's why the three says, even if he does not, do you have that kind of faith? Do you have the kind of faith that says, even if you don't do what I ask you to do, God, I will continue to trust you because I know that you are good. I know that you are loving. I know that you are wise. And that when you say no, I know it is for my good and for your glory. I think a lot of times we have a wrong definition of what faith is. In fact, if you look at Hebrews, the Christian's a hall of faith <laughs> where all these great men who, who believe God, you know, believe God and, and God did amazing things for them. Many times we, we look at the, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 or ch- chapter 11 of Hebrews and we begin to recount all these victories, victories over kingdoms, victories over kings and, and great miracles that happened because of faith. And we stop at verse 35. But notice what verse 36 says. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. So they suffered, but they also died. They were stoned in the case of Stephen. They were sawn in two in the case of Isaiah. They were killed with the sword in the case of the apostle James. They went about in skins of sheep and goat, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. But notice what God says about them. It's not that their faith was too weak. He says about them in verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. In other words, God esteemed the faith of these men and women, but because of his, but for, for reasons not known to us, because of his sovereign good pleasure, guess what? He allowed them to go through suffering. He allowed them to be martyred for him. It says, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves. Of the earth. There are times when God will say no to us. And it's not because our faith is too weak. And it's not because God has forgotten. It's because in his sovereign wisdom, he deems it best to say no. And our response is to be like Christ, who says, who who said to him in the garden, if it be possible that this cup pass from me, but what? Not my will, but your will be done. Now, it's not that Jesus had weak faith. Who has the best faith or the, the, the perfect faith but, but Jesus Christ? But there are times when God would, says, would say to us, no. And we, we need to accept it like Jesus and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Those who believe God have great faith in God. Um, in verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was not pleased. It says, was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, the first time he was angry, he was angry, but he liked them. That's why he was willing to give them a second chance. This time he's angry, and he doesn't like them, and he wants to see them dead. It says in verse 19, he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. The word seven is a perfect number. So basically what it's saying is he he ordered it to be as hot as it could possibly be. Throw in more coal, throw in more wood, 
Make it as hard as possible. Now, he was so angry that he wasn't thinking correctly. Because if you wanted them to suffer, you don't raise the temperature. What would you do? You lower it. Isn't that right? So that they're in there longer. Wow, that's sadistic. Okay, uh, I'm so glad God, God saved me. Okay, <clears throat> moving right along. So it says, he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. In verse 20, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army. So why the mighty men? Because he says, when he says, no one could, could deliver you from my hands, he didn't want any humans or gods to, to deliver him. So he ordered the, the strongest of his soldiers to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, their other garments. In other words, these things are very flammable. It says, And they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so the, the scenario in those days, so there would have been a kiln there, uh, something, a, a big oven for melting the gold that they had just set up, very close to the statue. And it would have been set against probably a hill. And on top of the kiln was probably around a, a big hole where they would lower down all the, all the metal to be melted. And in the bottom, they probably had a big, a big door where they could put in all the, all the wood and coal and the things to, to heat up. And so what they probably did was they took up Daniel, I mean Daniel, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on the top of the hill, and they threw them down into this oven. So the, the king saw that, and he began to watch. Verse 23, and the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Now notice what happens in verse 24. So at this point, at this point, if the story had ended here, it would still have been a great story. It still would have been one of the best stories in the Bible of men willing to die for their faith. But the third part, the third point I, I want to share with you is that people who trust God not only have great faith in God or great confidence in God and great courage for God, third, they also experience great conquest with God. In other words, they experience an exciting life uh, of God's uh, of God's presence in their lives and God's provision for their lives. Notice what it says in verse 24. Then the king was astonished and rose up in haste. So the king was watching. He was sitting probably in a, you know, one of those thrones that, that they were able to transport. He was sitting in a special chair and he wanted to watch. He wanted to see these guys rebelling against me. I'm going to set an, set an example all the rest who would dare to disobey me. So he was watching. Then all of a sudden he saw something that made him stand up. And, and he asked, he says, he declared to his counsel, did, did, did we not cast three men into the fire? The answer to the king, true, O king, yes, king. We threw it down, three guys. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire. And they are not hurt. The appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Ooh. He saw these guys. And when they threw him in, remember, they were bound. The only thing that the fire burned up was what? The ropes. And instead of, you know, these guys just, you know, falling down, guess what? They were walking around. Walking around like in their living room. Hey, guys, what's happening? And there was a fourth person. And guess what? When he saw the fourth person, it was like a son of the gods. Many people believe that this was, yes, yeah, that this was a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's a great point. That's a great principle. That what makes a situation bearable is, is, is whether Jesus is in it or not. That paradise when Adam and, Adam and Eve sinned, when God left, when they were estranged from God, and when their sins separated from God, that, that paradise became an awful place. But being in the middle of an oven was bearable. 
They, they not only survive, they thrive. Why? Because of Jesus' presence with them. And so let me submit to you that the key to victory in your person's circumstances is not necessarily to change the circumstance. It is to invite Jesus in that circumstance. So a lot of times we say, Lord, I can't stand this job. Could you please, please give me another job? Lord, I, I can't stand this marriage, Lord. Lord, I don't know if I'm going to be able to last another week. You know, I can't stand him anymore. I can't stand her anymore. And my suggestion to you, it's not necessarily to find a different circumstance. It is to invite Jesus in that circumstance. It is to invite Jesus in your marriage. It is to invite Jesus in your job. It is to invite Jesus in your school. Sometimes you think, oh, mom, dad, I don't like this school. Take me, transfer me to another school. And my question to you is this. Have you invited Jesus <coughs> into your circumstance? Even heaven, as wonderful as heaven is, do you know what makes heaven wonderful? It's not that it's a beautiful place, and it is. Look at John 14, 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Many times we focus on the fact that heaven is a wonderful place. But what makes heaven wonderful? Verse 3. Let's read it together. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Did you get that? Why is heaven a wonderful place? Not so much because it's beautiful, it's because Jesus is in heaven. When the thief on the cross says, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. What makes paradise paradise? It is the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel 26, it said, Then Nebuchadnezzar came to the door of the burning fire furnace, and you could just see him you know, inching closer, even though it's really hot. So he comes as close as he can without dying. And he declares, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. Man, amazing. They just walk out. You know, flames behind them. They just walk out. Kind of like a superhero movie, you know, you just walk out of the fire. Verse 27. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's council gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. Not a hair of their heads, and the hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. I love this. And no smell of fire had come upon them. They didn't even smell like smoke. Amazing. Verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, and I like this. See, the, the point of the story is not that these guys are the hero. The point of the story is that God is the hero. It says, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. By the way, if you live your life in such a way that people just praise you and not your God, then you're not doing something right. The whole point of living our lives is so that God gets the glory. It says, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. That's the point. These guys trusted God and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies. In other words, they were willing to die for their faith. They were willing to die for God, their God. It says, rather than serve and worship any God, except their own God. In verse 28, 29, because of what they did, guess what? They secured religious freedom for the nation of Israel who was in Babylon. It says, therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. When you live your life for God, guess what? You affect people around you. 
both Christians and non-Christians, are affected because of your obedience to God. Verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. At the end, what happened? They got pay raises. <laughs> Instead of being burned, there was a little extra in their check that month. So maybe you're experiencing peer pressure. But maybe because you refuse to, to participate in taking drugs that God protected you. And that these kids who you thought were your friends, uh, got, some of them got arrested, some of them got expelled, some of them dropped out of school, and, and God, brought, God brought new friends into your life who were godly and who were Christians, who are Christians. Or maybe you're that kid in college, and by saying no, you gave other Christians in the dorm courage to say no. And you started a prayer group, and you prayed for each other, and you became accountable to each other. Maybe you're that salesman who eventually gets fired because you're not meeting your quota, and you find a job at a new dealership. You don't have to sell used cars anymore. Now there's nothing wrong with the cars. And because people and word begins to spread that, that you're really honest, that you, be, you, you became the top salesman in that, in that dealership. And not only is it you have better pay, it's actually closer to home and you can spend more time with your family. Oh, whatever the case, understand that our God is able to deliver. That our God is greater than any circumstance, any problem, any person's. That, that is tempting us. In this passage, the king asks, who is able to deliver? Daniel and his friend says, God is able to deliver. God is greater than you. They had great confidence in God. But even if he does not, O okay, king, we will not bow down. We are willing to die for our conviction. There's courage for God. And finally, those who trust God experience great conquest with God. They experienced great victories with God. God. God was present. God was with them in the fire. God was praised. And then at the end, they were promoted. They experienced great blessings from the Lord. When tempted to compromise my conviction, I will stand firm because my God is able to deliver. When tempted to compromise my conviction, I will stand firm. Because my God is able to deliver. Even greater than physical deliverance is the spiritual deliverance that God offers us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 43, 2, one of the most beautiful passages in, in Isaiah. Says when you, let's read it together. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. But I like the next verse, which says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I like that. That he promises he is able to deliver us physically from water and fire. But even if he does not, he is our Savior. He is able to deliver us spiritually. Have you put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It is through the presence of Jesus in your heart. It is through his finished work on the cross that you and I can be with him in paradise someday. Is that your hope? Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if today you've come and you've never asked Jesus to save you, I, I invite you to come to him right now in the quietness of this moment. Let's pray this prayer with me. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I hear and now open the door of my heart. I receive you into my life as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, I thank you for anyone who, who prayed that prayer, and I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their faith in you, to grow in their relationship with you. If you are a believer and you, you came in today and you're facing all kinds of temptations, I, I don't know your circumstance, but God does. 
would you first and foremost invite God into that circumstance? God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how, to, how, how I'm going to survive this. I don't know how I'm going to face this. But God, I invite you into this circumstance right now. And God, through, through, through your grace, help me to stand up for my, my faith. Help me to stand up for my conviction. Now, whether you're a high schooler or college kid or somebody who's dealing with pressures from your boss, we, we just make a commitment to God. God, I trust you. I know, Lord, that you, you are able to deliver. And so give me the courage, give me the strength to go through this and to be victorious. Help me to trust you no matter what comes. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you, Lord, for your grace. I thank you for your speaking to us today through this familiar story. And I pray that we would be able to apply it in new ways in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.